Hi, good afternoon everyone. Good morning to some on the West Coast. I um, just want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is part two of our ITSM 101 series. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Moving Beyond Ticketing, Embracing Change for the Better. And as well, we've got a lot of new people that have joined today so that are going to be looking at sort of care works from the first time and um, sort of hearing from our side. So originally what we were going to do is sort of skip right into sort of moving beyond ticketing and what some of the leading companies uh, in the enterprise are doing with ITSM and sort of branching that out into the other aspects of the um, of the company into HR facilities and you know into things like problem change management um, what we're gonna do because there is a lot of new people joining uh, part two today is just do a quick intro of CareWorks again and then we'll dive into it so um, this is Derek Potra speaking I'm the sales manager here for CareWorks um, and I run the ITSM and managed services division and I'm joined by Jason Murphy who's one of our senior sales engineer and the lead on our ITSM and managed services side. So uh, the format for today, Jason and I will be just be going back and forth. Again, what we really want to focus on is, you know, if you already have an ITSM tool in place, um, really, you know, how you move that forward. And uh, if you, you know, if you're looking at potentially revamping your tools, what options are out there and what you should be focusing on when you're trying to mature your ITSM strategy within the organization. Again, I'll just cover CareWorks quickly because it's a lot of uh, people on the calls first look. We've been around 30 years and sort of started in, you know, the hardware, software side. Um, and as IT matured, uh, so did our organization. So moving into providing, you know, co-managed services, um, enterprise service, desk services, just to help um, organizations that were looking at, you know, maturing their internal IT processes and, and over the years, um, you know, we've amassed a lot of customers and, and different types of customers. We have customers that are, you know, in the 50 uh, employee range. We have customers that are in the 15,000 employee range. Um, so we do have quite a, a wide spectrum there. And it, the reason is we do offer a lot of different services to our customers. Um, so we've got about 15,000 customers that we service. Um, around the globe the majority of our customers are here in North America and, and that accounts for just over about a, a million end users and um, our service desk handles uh, just just north of 500,000 uh, tickets annually now um, so when you sort of look at you know care works and, and what we do um, I'm just gonna break it down into four sections for you and really what we're gonna focus on today is the you know you you would see on the screen is sort of the third arrow the managed ITSM division but just to give you a, a high-level overview uh, we have our 24 7 service desk which is really our enterprise service desk what this does is just gives you the ability to hand off frontline technical support and extend capabilities of um, our customers in-house teams so a lot of times they sort of say to us look we want you guys to take away the noise or maybe it's after hours support. They don't want to extend their team and have guys coming in late um, and working around the clock, so they'll have us help them with that. Uh, the other side is the co-managed services. So as I mentioned, you know, we came from the hardware software days and moved into um, a managed service provider. We're actually one of the top 25 MSPs uh, in North America. Um, so we do quite a bit there. And really what that's aimed at doing is, is allowing your internal IT department to again extend capabilities through a partnership mentality and leverage us for expertise really to augment you know the internal workings of your own environment we see a lot of our customers you know the experience turnover uh, in IT the you know, average is about 18 months so sometimes they'll have us come in and be you know a remote sysadmin or help with projects and things of that nature um, now within the managed ITSM division and where we're going to focus today and um, we'll actually sort of give you a, a, a demo as well Jason's going to give you a tour of our our ITSM product that we've built off of ServiceNow. Um, within there, we've got really four pillars. So Grand Central is the name of the product uh, that we've productized. And we sort of point that product at the mid-market to the enterprise. Um, ServiceNow is the leading ITSM platform out there. So they do a fantastic job with the global 2K market space. Uh, you know, your Googles, your Pepsis, your Coca-Colas, right? Um, so we've sort of notched our way just below that into the mid-market where companies really want that extensibility and that flexibility of a platform like ServiceNow uh, but potentially you know don't have maybe the resources or uh, potentially the budget to implement a solution within that mid-market um, arena. So we'll touch on that product 
Uh, we also have our enterprise service desk that we couple in with the managed ITSM. Again, I talked about the service desk and then our remote sysadmin service, which is unique. So if there's anyone on the call today that has ServiceNow, um, as you know, it requires internal sysadmins to run that, that platform. Uh, so we do a remote sysadmin service. A lot of companies that are experiencing transition or turnover uh, can lean on us to help them with their own instance of service now if they have it. Um, and then I talked about the hardware software side. We really offer that just to be the one hand to shake for our customers so that um, you know, we can fill all of the gaps for them. Now, you know, we talked about moving beyond ticketing and you know, there's a few different ways to look at that. You can look at it purely from a ticketing perspective and say, okay, my users email into my help desk or my ticketing solution and sort of Jason will define that for us in a minute. Um, but I wanted to put this pyramid up and sort of start with that so you can see, you know, from our perspective when we work with customers, really we look at from the bottom up. So one, what do they have in place for ITSM or service desk or help desk or ticketing? Um, how mature are they? Is it just incident management? Have they rolled out problem change and so forth? Um, but it's not just ticketing or incident management. We also look at what are they monitoring and actually, you know, the machine intervention, what do you have in place to be proactive to feed the, the ticketing or incident system you have proactively? Uh, so we look at automation there, we look at monitoring, and it's really just about maturing the organization. We've been doing this a long time, so a lot of times when we get into an organization to help them, they've got a lot of disparate tools, they're doing a lot of firefighting, there's not a lot of automation in place, um, so that's really where we focus on. And the first step is really looking at what tools they're using and then helping them adopt an ITSM solution that one will focus you know, on the end user experience. A lot of, you know, I talk to a lot of customers day in, day out, and Jason as well. And a lot of what we hear is, you know, we have a portal with our solution now, but none of our users use it. They just email us, um, you know, they fire over a, a text or they phone, you know, phone in. And there isn't sort of that one system of record. Um, the other thing we see is ITSM sort of be locked into just their IT division and it's not extended to HR facilities. So we sort of take a, a holistic approach, look at what they've got and then sort of show them what's possible with what other companies are doing out there. Um, and then the other thing is, are they doing proactive services? Do they have solar winds in place? Uh, that's another partner of ours along with ServiceNow. You know, to get a full view of the network, but from a proactive standpoint. So it's not just users submitting incidents. You know, it may be the monitoring system that's actually picking up a problem um, that's persistent, right? So that's sort of step one. And then from there, whether you have your own internal IT team or you're looking for help from a partnership perspective, really it's the same thing. A managed service provider acts as an internal IT department would within their own environment. So we, we sort of go down that road to look at you know, what does the network look like? Are you looking at moving to the cloud? You know, are you looking at, you know, sort of expanding infrastructure migrations? And then what do you, you know, how do you optimize that once you've made either that transition uh, or look at the infrastructure in place? So how do you wrap the services around it to be proactive and, and really make raving fans of your end users? Um, so, you know, when we sort of take that and we look at it from a transformation standpoint, you know, there's traditional IT and then like I said, what we do is sort of look at where you guys are at and help you move um, sort of up the chain from there. A lot of our customers are, are getting to a point where they're creating like a cloud store for that end user experience so that they can go in and self-serve really what they need across IT, HR and, and make requests and self-serve those through um, just for optimization on both front ends. So, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to sort of pass it over to Jason. What I'd like to do is we're going to focus on number one, sort of the blue pillar here that you see, um, ITSM. And, and again, we're, we're talking about moving beyond ticketing. So what can you do with the tools out there beyond ticketing? But I thought it would be good if Jason could maybe define for us, because I hear a lot of customers say different things. They call it ticketing. They call it um, service desks, they call it help desk, um, IT service management. So maybe we'll just sort of break that down and um, I'll let Jason do that and then Jason and I will go back and forth here um, for you for the rest of the, the component. Thanks Derek. Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Jason. Um, just a little bit of background on me, I've been in IT for the better part of uh, close to 20 years now. Um, you know, clawed my way up to uh, the sales engineering uh, uh, peak at this point, um, but his historically, um, 
I started off in a help desk. Uh, I worked for uh, a company where I was the kind of IT lead, and uh, we're not going back as far as the 80s, mind you, but um, back in the 90s, um, that's how I kind of you know started out. And historically, that's how a help desk really transitioned. Back in the 80s, it was someone who was kind of tech savvy enough within the internal organization who would really just help end users. And that's how it really kind of began. And then people would staff as kind of IT-centric people who would then just help end users. Now, um, through the evolution of help desk, um, there then became the, the service desk. And the important part there is that when ITIL, which, is, which stands for the IT um, Information Library, um, what that basically means is um, back in the 80s when ITIL began, um, what happened was is that uh, that service desk really started to flourish, right? It changed the, the, the reactive mindset of, of, of when I have a problem, um, I need a help desk person to fix it, to um, a service-centric approach to IT. And that's really what ITIL is about. Um, now, as you can see there at the bottom is that the focus was on incidents and service requests, right? So, and I'll get into a little bit of that as we move forward. But um, basically around, I would say, the mid-90s, um, even actually, I would say, the, probably the mid-2000s here in, 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 in North America, um, around 2004, 2005 is when kind of IT service management really kind of became the norm. Right, either from a software perspective or even from a an IT service delivery perspective, um, you know, you always had you know varying departments, whether it's finance, legal, HR, facilities, whatever you may have internally, um, you know, requesting service from IT. So instead of you know asking you know Derek to come fix my computer, it was you know let's log a ticket, right? And that's really about IT service manager. That's at least one one focus of IT service management. Now, and that really, again, began probably mid-2000s, at least here in North America, uh, ITIL being started in, uh, off in the UK. Now, just to kind of talk about the ITSM adoption and the reason why we look at ITSM um, is because, you know, incidents are coming in from just about everywhere. They can come in from internal, they can come in from external, your customers potentially, um, incidents are broken down as, you know, one is something broken. Um, and then this is more IT-centric stuff. Uh, you know, your IT person internally is, is looking to fix things, right? So when you have a sysadmin or a network engineer, um, is something broken? Um, is something down? Or is there a performance issue? Hey, my, my computer is slow or uh, my connection is slow. Now, a lot of those requests are also coming in from end users. Or, and end user is a very vague term because end users can also mean maybe yourself, uh, myself, but also the customer, right? You know, those can be things like inquiries, you know, I need access, um, you know, add me to this, install that, you know, as you can see, move, modify, and change. Now, there's a, a certain amount of noise that comes along with all of this, and that's where we get into kind of you know, just dealing with that noise. And uh, at least historically, um, I would say um, companies, at least that I've been dealing with, and again, Derek did show you that we deal with about 15,000 15, of them, um, is that a lot of them are still st kind of stuck in this old world mentality. And it's no one's real, it's really no one's fault. It's, it's a, um, it's how we do business. And the, the real issue has to center around email. Um, you know, email's been around for well, probably close to 40 years now, um, and we're still using it. Um, you know, even when we try to get away from it, um, it's often our, our kind of our business backbone, right? The problem with that is that when you start looking at email and spreadsheets, you know, when you get, um, you know, chat messages or calls, everything needs to be logged in, in, in some kind of digital format. And that can come in from IT or HR, you know, a security team, um, you know, again, finance, legal, wherever it's coming in from, again, it has to be collated within one central portal. And that, again, creates a lot of ticketing, what we call ticketing noise, right? Now, again, I divided that up in terms of incidents and requests, but there are some others as well. Now, and, and especially when you, when you start looking at, you know, remote management monitoring tools or, 
or network uh, monitoring tools, that creates even additional noise, right? So this is what happens is that you have to try to fight the noise, right? So it's one of those things that when we're looking at combating noise, um, we just deal with it, right, as, as, as IT people. Like a lot of the products that I see companies using, mm -hmm. um, whether it's Remedy or whether it's Manage Engine, or um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. Like why do you think, because all of them have front-end portals, or they talk about it, or they sort of advertise it. Like is it just a case of teaching, not being able to teach an old dog new tricks? Like why are they not using the front-end to be able to capture all that in one system and have a single you know, system of record. Why do you think everyone defaults sort of back to these ways? Like I hear a lot of people say, yeah, our email, you know, our users just email and then the email goes ahead and opens a ticket within our ITSM tool. The reason why that happens is it's not so much, it's not necessarily a technology problem, um, is that you know, IT service management is a very broad spectrum of, of things there's a lot of moving parts when you start looking at like the CMDB which in my opinion is probably central to any ITSM some do it well and some don't do it so well um, but the the important part is that's all of your assets either in a kind of a, a logical representation of, of, of your assets so you're looking at servers or you're looking at Windows devices maybe Macs or tablets or you know uh, it's a logical view um, of those of those assets uh, the problem is is that we're so centered around dealing with the problem or dealing with the incident or the requests that we we kind of get away from the, the core piece right and that is really the CMD because it kind of it's the it's the heart of your IT organization and we all kind of know that but we're also just you know trying to keep our heads above water fighting those fighting those problems yeah firefighting. It's, it's that firefighting mentality yeah. that you that you were talking about earlier so it, it's one of those things where um, people use ticketing but don't often have a partner, kind of like ourselves, that really kind of understand the inner workings of a, of a ServiceNow um, or our, our product, Grand Central, where we've kind of adopted those kind of ITIL best practices and locked them into ITSM. You know, you know ServiceNow is, you know, you describe it all the time as like a, you know, it's like a box of Lego. You can kind of build your own, you know, put it all together. But unless you have the, those core concepts, that, that, that foundation yeah. to build it the way it's supposed to be built, it's often, you know, done in kind of, I would say, a mediocre um, kind of mindset. Right. And, and, that's what and that's what happens from a lot of these, these vendors that are out there. Um, they give, that, you, give you the Lego box and say go. And, and kind go of go, yeah. right? You can kind of fill in the blanks and build it yourself. We've given you all the, the drop downs that you need, but there's no real kind of best practice that's built around it, right? And, and ITIL's been around for obviously, you know, as you know, 30 plus years. It's, 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 it's more than just a framework. It, it's how IT people and, and even, even outside of IT um, really need to focus the business. Because when, now that we're getting into what, what is now called lean IT, um, and if you've maybe heard some of these, these terms of, in terms of DevOps or, or Agile uh, concepts, um, it, it now is the time to really start looking at um, kind of how to do it better. Right. So, like, I, I, I don't know, a lot of the people I talk to, they want to make the move. It's sort of, you know, they're looking at new tools, better ways to do it. Um, but a lot of them are sort of stuck on it, right? For some reason, I know sometimes it's resource. Sometimes it's like you said, they want to do it, but they don't have the best practices. So they, they sort of stay with what they're comfortable with. Um, what does it cost? Like, what do you think the downside is if they don't sort of start adopting, you know, the new technology? Sure. I'm just going to kind of go into what is the cost of doing nothing, right? Um, you know, my tool is adequate. I think it's doing an okay job. Um, but if there's any kind of IT director or, or you know, a CFO that's, that's you know, potentially listening here, there is a cost of doing nothing to your business. And we are all trying to make efficiencies within our organizations uh, the best we can. And even though this is a kind of an IT-centric tool or an IT-centric mindset, it applies to all aspects of your business. Um, First thing is, do you have unproductive employees? You know, 
Are, are all employees running at 100%? I can tell you I do not run at 100% all of the time. Um, although if my VP is listening, um, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but the imp important part here is because of that, there is now a higher operating cost. So, and that is, and, and that is why the, the you know, IT service management strategy is really in place is to really lower the operating cost of, of your business. Like, do you think the self-service portion really facilitates that? Like, you hear a lot of it. Like, I've seen a lot of our customers who help implement a lot of the self-service solutions. Like, I guess that would one of the, be the big drivers for unproductive employees, sort of just sitting around waiting for requests, waiting, just waiting for things to happen. That's it. And, but you're talking about philosophical changes within any organization, right? Because everybody is stuck in email, right? Right. So... Part of that is this this strategy around Grand Central, where you give them this Amazon look and feel to ITSM that is just intuitive. You know, feels like social media, right? Like you just know how to use it. You know, right. if you've been on Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever flavor of social media you kind of spend time on, um, or if you've ever done any online shopping, it's all about just ease of use that your end users can just get it. Just add it to your cart and go. That's it. That's it. Now, again, another reason for, you know, you know, looking at ITSM as well is because of slow resolution times. When you're, when your techs are doing remote control day in day out just to fix problems. I mean, it's it's one of those things. There's better ways of, of, of doing things. Now, one example I like to give um, is, is um, you know, patching patching computers. Right? We all know ransomware is out there. We know that. There's tons of vulnerabilities all out there in the wild, and we have to look at AV, and we have to look at uh, patching our computers. Because if we don't, if, if from an IT point of view, if you don't patch a computer, you're putting your company at risk, or you're putting your IT organization at risk of not plugging those, those holes. You know, same thing with antivirus. If we're not keeping those you know, AV endpoints up to date, well, what happens is, is that they're at risk of infection. And then somebody has to get in there and, and fix those problems, and it's taking more and more time. So th these are preventative measures that we're doing, right? The other one is, you know, perimeter security in terms of, you know, just the firewall, right? You know, firewalls are there to really protect your organization from a device perspective. You know, the internet comes through it, and it's kind of blocking some, some protocols and some ports so that, you know, hackers aren't getting in there and, and looking through your, through your stuff. Now, the, the important part there is if we're not keeping that firmware up to date as well, well then you've got you know, these, these problems. Now from a business point of view, right? from an operational point of view, what happens if we do nothing with ITSM? What if we're using a, an old ITSM, you, know, you mentioned a couple of vendors earlier, I mean, I've been using them for a few years or longer. You know, I still kind of see that as, um, and you can see this in the middle, is that you know, I can do that in, in a, a spreadsheet type of, type of thinking. You know, you know, they log a, an email or they send an email to my, my ticketing solution um, and maybe it auto generates a, a ticket for my team, but then somebody has to triage that ticket and put it into the right bucket that the right resource is now going to get it. That is why self-service is, in my opinion, along with the CMDB, one of the most important features that we're going to bring to the table, right? right? Because you're making ease of use, right? So what I tell people when I onboard uh, our customers is that, the you know, first thing you want to do is really change the mindset of your organization. That's sometimes a daunting task, but when you bounce back an email and it says, click this link, right? And then fill out, fill out four little drop downs, right? That is the self service, right? Now, one thing I do want to touch on is, is that I found really interesting in terms of a Gallup poll is that uh, increased revenue, decreased costs, faster delivery time, uh, times all depends on an engaged workforce. Again, that is that that change of mindset, right? Now, again, companies with highly engaged workforces outperform their peers by 147%. Right. That is why it's advantageous for any company to look at uh, these kind of tools, right? Now, is your current, and this is a question that you have to ask yourself, is your ITSM keeping your, your uh, employees productive, right? Um, you know, does it have incident management? Probably. You know, any ticketing yeah. solution, any ITSM solution, all of the enterprise service management solutions out there um, have incident management. But does it have problem management? Um, in terms of problem management, I'll kind of describe this as I give a demo a little bit later on. But looking at incident problem 
change are probably the three most important things that you're going to bring to your organization along with that ITIL framework, right? Right. If that if it has order fulfillment, self service, change management, service level agreements, you know, increasing the um, the end user experience, you're then um, lowering your cost of right. doing business instead of increasing it and taking up more cycles and, and putting more uh, manpower at things. Yeah. So I guess like I hear a lot where you know the clients are saying, okay, we want to make some changes. We want to implement you know, maybe problem management, maybe change. You know, we're not using the CMDB in ours or you know things like that. So. Um, I hear a lot, you know, we need, we need a new system, but we don't know sort of how to get there, right? And um, so a, a, lot of, a lot of times there's a lot of acknowledgement sort of that they want something else in place. And so uh, you know, a lot of the talk is around having a system that allows easy requests for service, not only from IT though, I'm hearing a lot now, it's like, you know, HR wants to be part of this, right? Like onboarding a new employee. Or even offboarding a new employee. I right. mean, there's a lot of moving parts to offboarding employees. You've got access right. issues, you've got forms that need to be completed, etc. And a lot of it, what I'm finding is sort of that they want the same, you know, single point of record, uh, but they want the same front end. And then they want the product to be intuitive to know, okay, the user that's submitting that, right, to be able to capture who that user is, route them to the right back end, right, to the right person or actioner on the other side. Um, and so I hear a lot of it coming from the end user side. And so, you know, it sort of comes back to, well, how am I going to do that with email, right? Mm -hmm. Then I'm emailing 20 different people or 20 different departments or, um, so, you know, what we've focused on, and I guess, you know, maybe it would be a good point after this, uh, Jason, if we can sort of, you know, walk through maybe an example instance of, you know, what we've done with a lot of customers where that keeps coming up is how do I sort of centralize where they can communicate with IT, with HR, with facilities, um, and give the actioners the visibility into, okay, what's coming in from who, um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about what's between the requester, right, that's saying, I need this, I need that, or this is broke, or can mm -hmm. you fix this, and how we use automation, um, in workflows, right, sort of on the best practice side. One, to hopefully self-serve, but two, if we can, sort of route to the right actioners so that, you know, it, it's being expedited in, um, in a fashion, like you said, that's not resulting in downtime and unproductive employees. So, um, like we see, you know, from our side, you know, maybe you can get into the demo, but, you know, I think it's important to have all those features, incident problem change, but it be holistic in the approach that it could work across the organization as right, well. Right. And the example I always like to give is, you know, you know, just even provisioning a new laptop to a new employee. Obviously, HR has done their job. You know, they've got a desk. You know, um, but somebody has to get them a, a device of some sort. You know, whether that's a laptop, a desktop, uh, maybe a tablet. So wouldn't um, I just email you and say, Jason, Jim's starting on Monday. Can you get a laptop? And you know what? And we've been there, right? So it's one of those things where you're onboarding new well, employees. Jason oh, just got a response. Jason's on vacation. That's it. Right. And, and it's one of those things that um, there's a lot of balls that can be dropped in between getting that laptop, getting my director's approval for the cause, getting it to finance, getting it to fulfillment, or somebody who's going to order it for me. And then obviously having it then placed on my desk and then joined to the domain. And it, there's a lot of, a lot of actions that a have to happen. A lot of moving happen, parts, yeah. Right? But you have to create a life cycle. And this is the ITIL life cycle approach to IT service management is that, um, you know, our platform is designed with that life cycle already designed in there. Right. Right? And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we've talked to plenty of customers together. And it's like, okay, um, but I want to do this, or I want to make this change, and you can definitely do that within our system, and then we'll help you, you know, design it and make changes the way you you want. But out of the box, it's already designed with those processes in need, right? And yeah. and you know, yeah, I can talk forever about it. Let's just hop into the technology and kind of do a, a quick guided tour here. So the one thing I I kind of want to show people is, especially from a front end perspective, is that. So obviously, you know, you know, here's my my mock customer in terms of um, Acme. Lollipops. You know, Acme lollipops here. Over one billion lollipops shipped. 
but giving a, a simple and easy to use interface for an end user. Obviously, if for the people listening on, on the line, obviously this would be rebranded with obviously the, the company background or whatever you know your, your website looks like. But when I can come in here and simply submit a problem, right? When I submit that incident to your IT people, that's right here, it's four fields. So I'm or, looking at like, basically these would be the more like, our customers see these are the common things that I see. These are the tiles I want. Submit a ticket, make a request, which could be I need a laptop right. or I need a new chair. Or I need a, I need a form from HR. Right. Right. It, it can really be anything you want it to be. Right. Now, we would work with you in terms of what you want it to be. But right. it's one of those things where, you know, if I want, if I click submit a request, right. And then from, well, of course, let me log in here. Submit a request. You know, it can be anything. I can create workflows based on what those requests might be. Right. This is about ease of use, right. Derek. This is how we're going to, um, you know, transition. You know, provision a new laptop to you know getting the proper approvals and and getting it on the desk and joined to the domain. It's all based on these these tiles and. And people can fill this out very easily. The good news here is that when I want to, you know, you know, order a new workstation, this is my step. You know, as the end user requesting it, this is my first step. Right. But there's behind the scenes, there's 30 other steps that are going to kind of take place. Right. And that's the and that's where the balls don't get dropped. Right. So that's the workflow automation. That's piece that, that, that's it. It's all kind of automated in the background. Right. And that's the the intuitive design. I mean, as simplistic as we've made it here, right. um, that's the intuitive design that we're kind of bringing to the table. It's in, in software terms, we call that UX, right? User experience. Once upon a time, devs had kind of full control to kind of build code the way the way the the requirements were kind of laid out from the product uh, manager. Well, that that is now shifted, right? We have uh, uh, a middleman or middle person, we'll call them, um, who gets in there and really tries to understand. Yeah. you know mechanics of of design and and we've really got that kind of nailed down can you go back to that sort sure. of front page so this would like in this example this is the end user portal where i would come to you know to connect with whatever department i need to mm -hmm. um, like what i hear a lot when customers come out the other end and they've got their instance dialed in a lot of times sort of that 80 20 role where 80 percent of them have the same sort of pieces in place it's tweaked a bit obviously to their environment mm -hmm. but i mean in terms of the workflows and automations a lot of times it's sort of you know they they built off our best practices right so in your experience how customized does it need to be or should you just follow the best practices that are there instead of reinventing the wheel well from a lot of the you know id uh, you know id directors and, and and the folks that i've spoken to is is you know, especially with looking at, I mean, they've looked at ServiceNow and they, they love the capabilities, but how to get it off the ground, first of all, you know, to even develop, I mean, you, you're the, the dollars and cents guys, yeah. guy, but, and you know how expensive building this can be yeah. to any organization, right? Yeah. So the 20 rule, absolutely. We can do the additional 20%, but the 80% is already pre-built. Yeah. So... I guess it, it's hard for, I guess, the people listening to, to see what we've done in the background. So, like a new customer comes on, basically in a couple of weeks, like this is already pre-designed, you know, just it's customized for their look and feel. Mm -hmm. And then in the back end, all the workflows is not, like, I guess the best way to put it is we've taken a year of development of someone that would stand up a ServiceNow platform on their own, giving it to them on day one, and then we can make just tweaks to that is that a good way to put absolutely guess, okay. absolutely and 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 that's the benefit of of kind of our our, our grand central offering right is is that it's already pre-built it already has all of the itil best practices already designed behind the scenes i know you can't really see it in front of you um, but somebody's got to go in there kind of program it the way that the way that we we've done it um, and that can be tweaked in terms of that 20 percent rule right What's pretty cool front end, like I'm sure there's probably some people that work on the back side of the house too. Can you maybe show us the support view? And Of course. So let's hop into the support view. And as a, you know, kind of an IT administrator with my, my Acme admin account, 
Um, again, this is my enterprise CMDB. So this is where, again, I have a logical representation of my assets, not from just a kind of a, a physical device perspective, which I do have servers, network devices, what have you, but also things like email um, or my Oracle database, right? You're able to get in here and really see things the way they want or the way the IT people need because you need to have things like asset information, right? right. Serial numbers, uh, expiries, uh, license keys, all of it, right? You need to know what applications are installed per, per workstation or per server, right. right? So it's all contained within your uh, CMDB as what we call a CI, um, a configuration item. And yeah. There's all, obviously with any ITSM, IT service management, there's a lot of acronyms, but um, you know, as we go through, we'll kind of talk about a few of these. Like yeah. I see on the screen, you've got incidents, right? And we talked about ticketing being sort of the main piece and then right. where people are going from incident management. Like what are the, usually the next steps outside of incident management that they'll take a solution right. like this? Right. So, you know, when you're looking at, I mean, we, I think we all get incidents. I don't think we have to talk too much about incidents. Obviously, we're going to be able to create a form that, a, you know, an IT person can fill out and drop down in terms of either server issue or network issue. I mean, we all kind of get that part. Um, but, you know, when you start looking at incidents or noise as a whole, right, you know, there's over 400 pre-built reports that are already in here ready to go right. where you can really focus your problem management on root cause analysis right and for anyone on the line who has at least some ITSM background um, you know the your your end users your your customers want to know what that root cause analysis is or even the IT director who may be on this line want to know why things are happening and, and why they're happening right right and then how do I resolve this so it's not happening again and that's really tying into the problem management right right so if I have a you know, if I keep getting printer issues across my organization well let's log a problem and have somebody investigate that and remedy the issues so it's not affecting the 20 30 50 other people right right and that's where problem management really comes in I mean it's it's a huge benefit to any ITSM um, and if if you have one currently it's usually underutilized and that's probably because of resourcing Right. So, I mean, because everyone's firefighting with incidents, right? So this is where the problem piece comes in. Now, the change management piece, probably one of my favorites, is that when you start looking here, I'll just go into standard change. Um, when you start looking at, you know, a standard server change, um, it's you're able to come and get in here and, and reboot the Windows server. It's already templated. This is one I've already pre-built. Okay. And I simply walk through a wizard. Right. And right. This, this kind of takes care of all of my, you know, in terms of my change management board or what it was called a cab in ITIL. Um, you're able to get in there and get, you know, the VP involved. Right. Obviously, somebody's got to do the proper sign off. If I'm trying to make changes to my uh, my web server, but it, that's also the back end of my of my business because it's doing all the financial transactions. That's got to have some visibility across many, many people. As opposed to an IT person going in there and just, you know, doing a reboot at, uh, at at midnight or scheduling a reboot. Right. So it's all in here in terms of assess and authorize it. All of that, you know, ITIL best practice is already built in. Right. So this is just so for the, everyone on the line with us. So this is enterprise service now. So you know, really, what we've done is, uh, I talked about you know, our customer base being as small as, you know, 50 employees to 15,000. And um, it really, what we've done is we found that service now is attractive to most IT um, internal organizations. Uh, it just sometimes doesn't scale down well below, you know, a few thousand employees or, you know, an IT department of a couple hundred IT personnel. So what we've done is built out the instance on service now. So this is enterprise service now you're looking at. What we did was really just took, I guess on that, I guess a good analogy ends at 80-20. We've taken 80% of what customers need out of the box, built it out for them, stood it up, so when they step into the product, you know, they, they're really getting what you're showing here. It's right. already built out. Um, I guess, would that be a good way to put it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's pre-built out of the box. Right. Um, and But we both know, I mean, there are customers that will go in and want to make some changes. 
Uh, we'll work with them on those changes, obviously steering them in the right direction in terms of any kind of consultancy or what have you, yeah. um, you know, in terms of our own onboarding team. Um, but it's one of those things where it's already pre-built. Yeah. Right. And like, like we were using the Lego analogy earlier, uh, you know, you get basically a blank canvas with ServiceNow. Right. And, and you can have them build it for you, but that is obviously a very... Um, well, I guess not everyone has sysadmins or, you know, their own development staff too, right? Like a lot of the customers that I work with, they, they got a good IT team, but they're not developers or they don't want them doing that. They just want to use sort of the system and say, right. we want to we want to follow ITIL. We want ITSM. Yeah, we want problem change, mm-hmm. but just sort of give me, you know, give me the, the best practice on it. Okay, cool. Right. So, you know, obviously we can go through, you know, deeper dive in terms of, in terms of the demo. Um, you know, there's things like the configuration management database that's built in. Again, if you have a current ITSM, you know, obviously ours is, is, is pretty awesome and, and kind of built out. Um, but the CMDB is, is really where I, I kind of point people in the right direction um, in terms of building out a, comprehens- a comprehensive ITSM uh, solution. Again, 400 uh, reports are built into our report giving your your IT team real kind of true visibility in terms of dashboarding or reporting. Um, and obviously our, our service level manager is also built in here as well. You know, informing your team when, you know. That's a laser breach and that's stuff it. like that. Yeah, that's okay. it, that's it, that's it. We've, we've been talking a little bit about analogies. I just put this one together um, because it, it's relatable. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you want your pizza? But the idea here is, is there's a ton of ITSM products out there, you know, and, if you read a Gartner report or something like that, certainly ServiceNow and BMC, and um, you'll see ShareWell sort of up in the right-hand quadrant. Um, and all those are, you know, uh, most of them now are SaaS-based, right? Well, ServiceNow is born in the cloud. So, you know, if you think of pizza as a service, right, and after this webinar, you're hungry, <laughs> and you're gonna go out and you're gonna, you're gonna you know, pizza's what you're gonna have tonight for supper. Right? You've got a few options to do that. And I relate this back, and this can be related to the IT world, but specifically we're talking about ITSM. So you've got you know, the traditional way of doing it, which would be going out and you know, make it yourself. You go out, you buy the product, you know, we talked about it at the beginning, and then you build everything from the ground up. You buy you know, the cheese, the toppings, the tomato sauce. They're all disparate, and you try and piece those together and, you know, um, there's some, you know, you can get some, uh, I guess, uh, what would you say, uh, you know, for someone that's building that at the end of it, you get that, okay, that, that was cool, I put that together. But it takes a lot of time. Satisfaction, right. Yeah, the satisfaction. It takes a lot of time. Um, and in most cases, when you try and, and my wife and I have done this tons of time, you think you're going to save yourself money building it at home, but then you have to buy the whole pepperoni and the whole brick of cheese <laughs> and the whole jar of tomato sauce. It ends up costing you three times more than just right. ordering a pizza. Um, so then there's the option, right? So you, you can sort of just build it from scratch, ton of time, ton of resources. You got to throw everything at it. You could go out, you know, to the grocery store and just pick up one of those freezer ones, bring it home and bake it. But then you're still providing, right, the electricity, you know, the oven. You got to fire that thing up, the dining table, the drinks, right? So there's still some, still some work that goes along with that. Um, and then you've got platform as a service. So think of that as pizza delivery, right? You're just gonna, hey, pizza's what I want. I'm dialing the pizza guy, he delivers the pizza. But still there's that aspect where I gotta clean up after it, mm-hmm. right? I gotta, you know, I gotta set the table. Uh, I gotta bring the drinks to the table. Uh, but we're getting closer to the model where it's like, okay, I want pizza, I'm gonna go sit down. I'm gonna go dine out. And I'm going to have everything delivered to me. And I'm not going to lift a finger. And I'm just going to get what I want. And at the end of the day, that's pizza tonight, right? Um, and so the restaurant manages everything for me. And I just walk out. But then if I want it again, I can go back and use it, right? And I can that's go it. back and sit down and order the pizza again. So that's sort of the analogy with ITSM. And really what, what we've done here is said, okay, there are companies that are going to want to build their own. And that's why we do the implementations of, you know, with ServiceNow and we have our remote sys and admin services. There's companies that are going to sort of want, you know, to get to a certain point and then have the last 20% customized and we can do that. And then there's some companies, you know, that are really just going to 
just want to use the product and say, give me the best practice approach and just let me use, you know, what you guys, based on your experience, have built out. So that's sort of what we've done. And you think about what we've done with ServiceNow is productized it so that you can just start using it based on a best practice approach. And if you look at, you know, some of the, you know, leading companies out there, um, you know, that's what they've done with the product. And they've focused on, you know, moving away from traditional tools um, into, you know, in these cases, they all use ServiceNow, Yale, Sony, and, and uh, Lath and Watkins. And really the main takeaways from Yale was their mean time resolution. Um, you know, if you look at the bullet points on the screen, what they're able to do is consolidate five applications into the cloud, uh, mature their ITSM process, and they actually um, were able to introduce a lot of self-service. So they improved their mean time to resolution by 40%. Um, and they had a ton of cost savings because they moved off of HP Service Manager and they had about you know five ten resources uh, depending on on the time when they had to do upgrades in that dedicated to that on-premise infrastructure um, so pretty cool and then Sony theirs was all about sort of end-user um, self-service and uh, they actually ripped out their old tool stood up service now within 60 days um, leveraging a managed service provider uh, which is pretty cool because a lot of a lot of the stories you hear you know it's it's years to get that or you know six months to a right. year to stand it up and uh, latham watkins like sony um, they started using service now to automate services um, delivery and they quickly understood that it was really a business process product sort of like we talked about it's not they moved from it being an it centric tool right it's more than just it um, so you know more to that platform approach so that's really what we've done with you know with Grand Central that said look you know take that pizza analogy let's go dine out tonight right and you know what what Grand Central has is all these features built in so you've got you know the main I guess steak and potatoes that you'd want right incident problem change the cool end user portal the knowledge base so um, you know, asset management and, and the SLA reporting. So that's the idea is, you know, if, if you're looking at a best practice approach, if you're looking at modernizing your end user experiencing experience, modernizing your ITSM, then it could be an option. But um, really what we wanted to do is sort of give you some possibilities that are out there today. And, um, you know, if you do want in any additional information, we're going to be sending out this recording to all the attendees. So you have that. And uh, with that will be the contact information. If you have any questions, if you want some guidance in any area, Jason can provide or our team um, if you're looking at options out there. I just thought I'd finish with this because it just gives you an idea of, you know, maybe based on the, the size of your organization, um, you know, what sort of fits the bill for you, right, in terms of you know, whether that's Grand Central or whether it's, you know, your own service now. The idea is, you know, companies that we see over, you know, sort of a thousand employees that ServiceNow application really starts to uh, to resonate with them. Um, and then on the managed service side, we resell SolarWinds. And, you know, Jason, maybe you can just talk just quickly about SolarWinds and how that ties in with, like, an IT incident management solution to sort of round off the tools side. Sure, sure. I mean, at least from a ticketing perspective, it's one of those things where, you know, everyone's doing ticketing, you know, whether you're, you know, 20 seats or whether you're 2,000, right? But somebody has to manage endpoints, right? So, you know, whether that is, you know, your end user workstations or those servers. Um, I come from a, a kind of a network monitoring background. So uh, when I, when I uh, used to work for SolarWinds, um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, the, the tool kind of, you know, sends out alerts. Right. Um, but it's also um, making heads or tails of those alerts, and that's where ServiceNow can come in and really uh, dial in kind of what is most important versus maybe just a performance hit or right. a performance issue. I mean, and, and that's always the challenge with any you know remote management monitoring tool or any kind of network monitoring tool is that a lot of it just turns into noise. Somebody has to get in there and decipher it. Well, let automation, let let ServiceNow do all that heavy lifting so that you know what is priority, right? Right, and that's and that's where um, you know tools like like ServiceNow really kind of stand out. Right. Okay. Excellent. Well, I mentioned if you have any questions, what we're going to do now is we've got um, just about eight minutes left till the top of the hour, so. Um, we're just going to go to the questions now. So if you have any questions, just pop them in there, and we can uh, 
go through those. Let me just open this up now. And I just put up on the screen as well, uh, within the follow-up email, we'll send out, we're having a part three on uh, September 19th, which is actually going to be with our CEO and our Vice President of Sales, so our CEO Mark Scott and Marco Lavecchia. Um, so we'll be going through that uh, on the 19th of September at the same time. Uh, so we've got a couple questions here um, that I'll take. Uh, the first one is, what type of costs are associated with well, service now uh, implementations that that we've seen. Um, so it it really ranges. I guess a, a good way to answer that um, from what we've seen working with customers uh, that are standing up their own service now instance is it depends on the number of uh, they call it fulfiller licenses, the number of technicians that are going to be using the product. It's not a cost for the end user to submit incidents, it's really the actioners that are taking those incidents and it could be you know IT, it could be HR and fulfilling on those requests. Um, and the licenses range based on the version of the product and based on the features but sort of ballpark would be anywhere from 100 to 150 dollars um, a license a month um, for the licensing and then the implementations depending on how many uh, you know, technicians you're standing up and how many features or customizations how you many require. Departments, uh, yeah, how many yeah. departments you're integrating. That can range from, you know, 50,000 to honestly 500,000 we've seen on some implementation partners. So um, that's sort of where, you know, I don't want to toot our horn, but that's sort of why Grand Central resonates which with a lot of the mid market customers because they don't have any of the implementation costs. They just, step into the product and start using it on a subscription which for, for some of those companies works better. One of the other questions here is uh, for Jason it just asks you know with with tools outside of, of ticketing as we're talking about I guess on the theme of going beyond ticketing like what tools have you seen be successful in automating service delivery? Um, I guess maybe like things like patching I'm not sure what they mean to automate but sure sure I mean I mean I the, Automation is obviously a really kind of robust uh, name uh, in in either monitoring circles or in in ITSM. Uh, it go it goes to say that when you start looking at workflow automation, that is your biggest business gain, right? When every when, when those I, as I say, I's are dotted and those T's are crossed. When nobody's dropping those balls, that is the most um, advantageous part to something like. Uh, Grand Central. It is out of the box. It is turnkey, right. right? So instead of having to kind of piece all your Legos and build your castle, you know, if you want to add a room, hey, no problem. But nobody wants to, to go from basement up, right? And and that's where that uh, you were just talking about, where that that financial investment is in in something like service now. But we've already done a lot of the heavy lifting already. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like that's all the, the questions for now. Um, you'll see on the screen here, we've got sales at careworks.com. If, you know, it always happens after these things, you sort of think of questions after. So fire those through. We're going to put together a follow-up email, like I said, with the recording and send that out to everyone. Um, as long as well, there will be a separate email with the Starbucks gift card um, that, that you'll get, obviously, for, uh, for attending the webinar. So I just want to thank everyone for their time. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, hopefully we catch up with you on part three um, in mid-September. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.